Hi everybody, welcome to another lecture. Uh, this week we are going to continue with our discussion of some of the central bureaucratic agencies and some of the key actors in government that are responsible for foreign policy making. And this week we are going to move on to talking about one of the biggest organizations. Uh, it's actually a collection of a lot of uh, smaller organizations, some of which are still pretty big by comparison to other agencies in government, uh, but that's the U.S. military. Uh, again, there are a bunch of uh, smaller organizations that make up the U.S. military and the Department of Defense as a whole, uh, but over the past 70 years, it has become one of the leading forces in uh, U.S. foreign policy making, uh, to a great extent uh, supplanting traditional organizations like the State Department in that process. So today we're going to uh, basically dig into thinking about uh, what does the Department of Defense look like? How is it structured? How is it organized? Who are some of the key personnel that we should be thinking about? Uh, and what has its role uh, looked like over the past 70 years and how has it changed? And what are some of the, the key pieces of legislation along the way? Again, as per usual, we're going to have a quick historical background here. We'll think about the organization of the Department of Defense, think about what are some of the major component parts, some of the pieces of the DOD and the military as a whole, and how do they relate to one another. Uh, we'll think about the organization of the U.S. military specifically, kind of more narrowly within the context of the defense community. And last, we'll think about military leadership and politics. Now, this is a multifaceted topic. There's a lot to cover here. So as, again, as per usual, we're not going to get to everything. Uh, but the military is an intensely political uh, entity, a political actor in U.S. foreign policy and in U.S. politics, even though we also try to keep it as apolitical as possible. Uh, but that effort to keep it apolitical is itself a political effort and a political statement. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that and we'll cover some of the uh, kind of historically important events uh, that have uh, shaped uh, the U.S. military's relationship to politics. But also think about some more recent events that have drawn the U.S. military into uh, politics more directly. Now, some key questions to think about here. How has the organization of the U.S. military changed over time? We've talked about some of this before, so it should look pretty familiar to you. Uh, think about what is the general structure of the U.S. military. Go back to the lecture on bureaucracies, right? A lot of what we're going to talk about this week is going to look really familiar, and a lot of the general uh, discussion of what bureaucracies look like and what do they do, uh, this applies to the Department of Defense as well, right? So just be aware of that. Uh, and let's think about, uh, again, the military as a political actor, both in terms of uh, the military as an entity who behaves in a political way, but also thinking about uh, the military as the subject of civilian politics and something that is affected by civilian politics. So there are a couple of different angles that we have to think about here when we think about the military in terms of it uh, being political. Uh, and last here, related to this, how is the military a political institution, right? We'll think about the different ways in which politics pervades uh, the military, even when military officials are trying to not be political actors. So again, first of all, we're going to cover the historical background here. The U.S. military is something that is as old as the country itself, but it has changed remarkably over the past 70 years or so. Uh, so, very quickly here, what you need to know before we get into the, the 1950s, the Cold War period, is that the military looked a lot different than it does today. If you go back to earlier lectures, you'll recall that the percentage of the U.S. population that is serving in the military at any given time is substantially lower in the pre-World War II period and pre-Cold War period uh, than what we see after. Right. World War II represents a, a clear spike in terms of the number of people serving uh, in an active duty capacity, but traditionally the U.S. military has been very, very small. Uh, also recall that even though we often think in sort of, sort of conventional wisdom terms, we often think of uh, the U.S. military as not being active, uh, we think of U.S. foreign policy as being incredibly isolationist prior to World War II, this is not the case. The U.S. military is very active in U.S. foreign policy, but most of this is occurring in the, the quote-unquote near abroad, right? It's occurring on the frontier, it's uh, involving, uh, you know, fights against Great Britain, fights against various Native American tribes, fights against Mexico in the mid-19th century, and so the U.S. military is very active, but at the same time, it's a very small component of American society compared to later periods. 
Now, another thing to take note of is that even though the overall number of military personnel has declined since the early Cold War period, uh, the steady uh, accumulation of veterans as a result of the relatively high number of active duty personnel serving at any given time means that a fairly large proportion of the American population still has military experience. Um, about 20 to 23, 24 million veterans uh, are living in the United States right now, and this is a non-trivial chunk of the population. So even though active duty personnel uh, have declined, right, we still have quite a few people who uh, have served at one point or another uh, in the military. Um, but there's also this broader question here that animates any discussion of these historical divides and change points, and that is, is military service necessarily uh, a prerequisite for political leadership? Is it necessarily a good thing? Uh, and the reality is, again, for much of American uh, history, right, for much of U.S. history, most political leaders uh, have not had extensive military careers. Uh, again, the U.S. government from its founding is built on this idea of civilian primacy and civilian leadership, uh, although this mindset has, again, changed a little bit with World War II and the Cold War time period. And we'll get into that more towards the end of the lecture. Now, as I've discussed before, the military looked a lot different in the pre-World War II time period, in the pre-1947 time period specifically. Uh, specifically, the Army and the Navy were two separate branches. There was no unified Department of Defense for most of U.S. history. And the Marine Corps, while it has existed uh, since the late 1700s, existed under the auspices of the Navy. It still does, but it has achieved some additional autonomy and uh, recognition uh, in later time periods than in earlier time periods. Now, to understand the evolution of the Department of Defense, we have to understand a little bit about what happened during World War II. Uh, World War II, in spite of you know, the, the sort of popular memory of World War II as representing a triumph of American ingenuity and uh, military prowess, the reality is uh, what came afterwards was very much a reaction to the chaos and the problems that high-level policymakers saw during World War II. Uh, President Truman famously stated, quote, we must never fight another way, a war the way we have fought the last two. I have a feeling that if the Army and the Navy had fought our enemies as hard as they fought each other, the war would have ended much sooner. Um, various government officials criticized President Roosevelt's management strategy, his approach to uh, kind of playing subordinates off of one another. It was a very disorganized approach to government, and this was especially problematic uh, during wartime. Uh, inter service rivalry between the Army and the Navy was a big problem during this time period, and it's something that continued into the Cold War time period. It's something that still continues today in many respects. Uh, but what we see coming out of World War II was an effort to address these problems, to address inter service rivalry, to address complications in the chain of command and the overall uh, governance of the U.S. military and how it interfaced with civilian authorities. Now, similar to the U.S.'s reticence uh, of adopting a, a sort of um, diplomatic corps and titles that were reminiscent of old world Europe, the U.S. military was structured in a way, in part, as a reaction to the way that European militaries were, were structured. And the U.S. had long avoided uh, a clearer, more organized, more holistic kind of general staff approach of the sort that uh, was present in the militaries of Great Britain or Germany. Uh, and so this is partly a, a reason why or partly an explanation for some of the disorganization. Uh, now, regarding the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Henry Stimson here, pictured on the left, noted that it was, quote, an imperfect instrument of top-level decision because it remained incapable of enforcing uh, a decision against the will of any of its members. Uh, similarly, George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, had noted that there was a real lack of unity uh, that has handicapped the successful conduct of the war. So, again, part of what we see coming out of World War II is that in spite of the popular memory and the rah-rah, the right, there are some real problems that military leaders and civilian leaders see coming out of this time period, and unity of command and interoperability and joint uh, operations, the ability to successfully plan and prosecute joint operations, uh, and just general cooperation in the distribution of resources between the branches. These are all big problems that policymakers are seeking to address.
Now, the National Security Act of 1947 is the big cornerstone piece of legislation that is intended to address these issues. Uh, it creates the precursor to the Department of Defense, which is the unfortunately abbreviated uh, National Military Establishment, or NME. Uh, it's replaced by the Department of Defense in 1949. And importantly here, it creates the uh, Air Force, right? This is uh, the Army Air Corps breaking out of the Department of the Army to become uh, its own standalone service branch with its own civilian department. Um, and it also creates a unified... Uh, military under a civilian secretary, right? This is what the National Military Establishment and later the Department of Defense do. There's a new civilian secretary of defense, James Forrestal, who we'll see shortly, is that first secretary of defense. Uh, and this is importantly intended to, again, unify the military under one civilian body with one civilian leader who answers directly to the president. Uh, and it's a, uh, an attempt to promote uh, unification and, and greater cooperation. However, there were a lot of officials during this time period who opposed unification because they had prior loyalties or concerns, uh, maybe loyalties to previously existing service branches like the Navy, uh, and they were worried about what unification would mean for those branches. They were worried in some cases that the Navy or the Marine Corps, for example, might be phased out of existence or relegated to secondary roles, and they wouldn't enjoy uh, kind of primacy of place when it came to actual war fighting capabilities. Now, as I mentioned before, James Forrestal was the first Secretary of Defense. He was actually one of these individuals who was opposed to unification. He had previously served as Secretary of the Navy, and so he was really very much concerned with what the Department of Defense would do to the Navy. There was concern that the Navy would be relegated to largely a transport and anti-submarine uh, warfare role, uh, and that its surface warfare capabilities, that its uh, evolving air war capabilities, that these capabilities would be stripped away and reallocated to the Army and to the Air Force. Now, we'll talk about these conflicts more later, but suffice it to say uh, that this is initially a relatively weak position. It doesn't really have the capability to enforce the president's will uh, on, on the military. The service chiefs still have a lot of autonomy and a lot of power. And we see later legislative efforts aimed at uh, addressing these problems that, that persist right well past the National Security Act. It's intended to address a lot of these problems, but it doesn't succeed in addressing all of them. Now, the next few slides, we're just going to look at how the Department of Defense is organized, right? We've kind of covered very briefly some of the history here. We'll come back at the end and talk more fully about some of the history here coming out of World War II uh, when we think about how the military is a political institution, how it's affected by politics. Uh, but for now, we're going to set that aside and we're just going to think about the Department of Defense in terms of an organization. Like, what are the key parts? Who are the key actors, right? That's what you should be getting out of this section. Now, the main components that I want you to think of here are the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the OSD. This is the civilian side of the Defense Department. When we talk about the Department of Defense, we're talking about a lot of different parts, a lot of smaller organizations. Now, when I say smaller, it's, it's relative, right? There's something like, uh, you know, 2.53 million people kind of combined when we're thinking about who works uh, under the Department of Defense, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, but some of these are military personnel, some are civilians, some are career, appoint, uh, uh, career officials, others are civilian appointees, political appointees. Um, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover here. But there are kind of four main bodies that I want you to think of. There's the Office of the Secretary of Defense, as I mentioned. This is the civilian side of the DOD. This is the Secretary of Defense, right? This is uh, uh, one we typically think of when we think about the DOD's administration. There are the military departments. Now, these are a combination of civilian and military officials, but they are, uh, in general, we should, we should probably think of them more as uh, the civilian side with the actual service branches being the military side. But the service branches fall under the department of, say, the Army, right? There's the civilian side of the Department of the Army, and then the U.S. Army itself falls under the Department of the Army. We'll, we'll look at this more later. Uh, there's the Joint Chiefs of Staff here, and this is kind of the joint decision-making body, uh, the representative body where the heads of the different service branches come together and uh, talk about logistics and planning and give advice to political leaders. And lastly, there are the combatant commands. 
Uh, even though the Army Chief of Staff is nominally the head of the Army, they are not directly involved in war planning and war fighting and the prosecution of wars. This falls to the combatant commands. These are the regional and functional commands like Special Operations Command, European Command, Africa Command. Uh, these are the entities that are intended to promote greater cooperation between the service branches, uh, but they also are directly in the operational chain of command. We'll talk about what that means more later. But this means that they are very important for actual war fighting. Now to break this down here, uh, across the top we've got each of these four entities and we've also got uh, some information under each of these four entities talking about what it is that they do. So again, the Office of the Secretary of Defense is the civilian side of the military. This is your secretary, uh, your deputy secretaries, assistant and undersecretaries, uh, and various civilian um, uh, offices and bureaus. The military departments, right, this is uh, where we have um, kind of mini Department of Defenses embedded within uh, for each one of the specific branches. Um, we have the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. We have the new Space Force, which actually falls under the Department of the Air Force. The Marine Corps similarly falls under the Department of the Navy. So this is why you should just be aware that uh, within the Department of X, right, there may be multiple service branches. Um, so just be aware that, for example, Space Force and the Marine Corps exist within um, a, a, a department that is not uh, clearly labeled to match that service branch. Um, but again, the key takeaway here is that these are less about war fighting and more about doctrine, recruitment, planning, uh, maybe the development of weapon systems, contracting, things like this. Uh, they're the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Again, this is kind of the upper level management, the leadership of the various service branches. Um, these are the people who serve as kind of the principal advisors to, um, to the President and to Congress. Although combatant commanders and civilian officials from the departments, uh, they all also play an important role in this process and, uh, and serve in an advisory capacity when called upon. Uh, and last year, as I mentioned before, the combatant commanders, uh, they are the ones who kind of do the stuff out in the field, right? When we're thinking about war fighting, it's the combatant commands that field unified uh, combat forces made up of personnel from the different branches, and they are the ones who plan and execute actual uh, military operations. Now, the National Security Act of 1947 uh, attempts to address some of these issues that I highlighted earlier, but it doesn't get to all of them. Some of these uh, issues of inter-service rivalry, they persist over time, and it's stuff that legislators and military leadership really struggle to deal with. Now, the Goldwater and Nichols Act here is the next uh, major uh, effort to actually restructure the military to resolve some of these issues. Notably, this doesn't come until 1986, and I think that this is uh, partly a testament to just how difficult it is to actually pass legislation that restructures such a massive organization or collection of organizations. It's really tough, and even the Goldwater-Nichols Act doesn't actually solve all of the problems that it's intended to solve. So while this could be apocryphal, I've not found any evidence to indicate that it's, that it's not true, but uh, an example of the sorts of coordination problems that the Goldwater-Nichols Act was intended to, to solve, uh, during the invasion of Grenada, an army officer purportedly had to use his AT&T card uh, and a payphone to call in air support for his troops because the Army and the Air Force were not operating on the same frequency. So there were a lot of uh, basic kind of disconnects like this uh, that uh, presented problems for interoperability between the military branches. Um, similarly, the different branches, because they run their procurement processes differently, because they have different standards for, say, anything from, you know, radio equipment to, uh, you know, heavier pieces of equipment to the basic sidearms and weaponry that their personnel carry. Um, this can present interoperability problems. Uh, if everybody is, say, carrying a different weapon or different ammunition, uh, it can make it really difficult to run combined operations uh, if you, you are not using the same, you know, basic starting point uh, to launch those operations. Now, one of the big things that this does, that this piece of legislation does, is it removes the Joint Chiefs of Staff from the chain of command. So now the chain of command here, as you can see at the bottom, runs directly from the President to the Secretary of Defense to the combatant commanders. Now the combatant commanders, again, operate or they run the uh, combined geographic and functional commands. Now what does this mean? 
The key uh, term here is combine. They combine forces from all of the different service branches or most of the service branches. Uh, they might still be weighted more heavily towards one branch, like Pacific Command may be more heavily weighted towards uh, the Navy in various ways. Uh, but the idea here is that because they are uh, running military operations and overseeing personnel from every branch, the idea was that they would probably be less parochial uh, and better able to uh, plan military operations with a more holistic kind of view since they were commanding troops from every branch. Now, the next couple of slides are going to show you, I'm going to go through them very quickly. You can spend some more time looking at them if you want, but it shows you the basic overview, uh, the basic structure of the U.S. military, of the civilian and military components. Um, briefly here, this is the overall Department of Defense. As you can see here, it lists the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, the Departments of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. It shows you the service branches under those departments, as I mentioned before. Note here that the Navy and the Marine Corps are both under the Department of the Navy, right? There is no Department of the Marine Corps. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Staff under them represent uh, another kind of separate body here. And then there are the Combatant Commands over to the right. Note that that line uh, in the hierarchy goes directly up to the Department of Defense, right? They answer directly to the Secretary of Defense and then in turn they answer to the President. Now the Office of the Secretary of Defense has its own uh, leadership group. Uh, each one of these folks here under, this is a little bit dated, but each one of these folks on the second level underneath the secretary and deputy secretary, these are the undersecretaries, right? This is that third leadership tier. Uh, under them will be various assistant secretaries, and we'll look at those folks shortly here. Uh, here you can see a list of the various assistant secretaries. Uh, note that uh, the assistant secretaries and the undersecretaries, right, they all have some sort of like policy area. Right. Um, here, if we look at the assistant secretaries, you can see uh, up at the top here, uh, Kevin Fahey, for example, is acquisition. Um, Robert McMahon over here is logistics. Mary Miller over to the left here under the research and engineering uh, is uh, research and engineering. Right. If you look down under policy, you have folks who handle international security, homeland uh, defense and global security, Asian Pacific security affairs. Right. There's a mix of functional and geographic uh, focus areas within the civilian side as well, not just the military. Now, when we look at the various uh, defense uh, agencies and DOD field activities, there are a bunch of other um, officials here. Right. And they serve even more specific functions. They have uh, an even more specific kind of directed portfolio, if you will. Lead civilian official who is in charge of both the civilian and the military sides is the Secretary of Defense. Now currently, that Secretary of Defense is Mark Esper. Uh, he, is an, he is a political appointee who is subject to Senate confirmation, as we've discussed before. Uh, he has a military background. He was actually a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. He's gone on to serve on Capitol Hill and also served in the, the private sector for uh, defense firms. Um, and so this profile is not altogether uncommon, right? It's often the case that uh, secretaries of defense have some military background. Most of them are officers. Uh, Chuck Hagel, as we discussed before, was actually the first secretary of defense to come from an enlisted background. Um, it's also the case that occasionally we see some secretaries of defense having more technical or scientific backgrounds. Uh, Ashton Carter was a physicist before he entered politics, and Jimmy Carter's secretary of defense, Harold Brown, got his PhD in nuclear physics at Columbia at the age of 21 and worked for quite a while in uh, the scientific field, right, in the natural sciences, before he went on to enter government. Now, this is, again, a reflection of the fact that Foreign policy is becoming increasingly technical over time as our military affairs more broadly. Okay, so that's kind of the, the bird's eye view of the military. We're gonna narrow down a little bit more and think about the organization of the military itself. We've talked about the Department of Defense and the military in a, a very broad kind of holistic sense. Again, this is a, a very much a crash course through this. Uh, but next we're going to think more about uh, the military services and how they are organized and how they relate to one another, uh, as well as things like the combatant commands. Now, again, this slide is a little bit dated here, but the point isn't to show you who's in office now. You can look that up. Uh, but this provides you with a very good overview of some of the key positions and personnel here. 
Um, now, up at the top row here, we have over at the left, General Joseph Dunford and General Paul Silva. Uh, they were the chair and vice chair, respectively, of uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then note that following them here, we have General Mark Milley, who's actually the current uh, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, but he was at this time the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Chief of Naval Operations, Commandant of the Marine Corps, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and Chief of the National Guard Bureau. Right, so up at the top here, these are the heads of the respective services that come together uh, to represent those services, to talk about inter-service issues, and to advise civilian leadership. Uh, now, the second row here shows you the various functional and geographic combatant commands. Now, again, these folks answer di directly to the Secretary of Defense and to the President, uh, and they are the ones who are responsible for overseeing specific functional issues or, again, war planning uh, and, and sort of thinking about uh, military operations within a specific geographic context, right? Maybe Europe, maybe uh, the Pacific, maybe the Middle East under Central Command, for example, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later. Now, at the bottom row here, we have various offices and officials that are associated with the Joint Staff. Now, this is a collection of military officers and staffers uh, who work for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and help to uh, kind of deal with joint planning and, uh, and sort of running bureaucratic affairs of the military at kind of this, this high inter-service level. Now, as we've seen before, a lot of these positions deal with specific functional issues. For example, uh, we have Director of Operations, Director of Intelligence, the J-2, Director of Manpower and Personnel, the J-1. Uh, over uh, to the right, we have the Director of Cyber Operations, the J-6, uh, the Director of Joint Force Development, right? They all have a specific portfolio, right? A more narrow uh, kind of functional or issue-specific por portfolio on which they focus uh, and help to provide uh, guidance and set policy and implement policy for the Joint Chiefs of Staff more generally. Okay, now one other thing that I want to note here is that some of these positions can serve as stepping stones to a higher rank and kind of more power and influence within the military. This might seem self-evident since most of these folks down on the bottom working for the Joint Staff uh, are at the three-star level. Uh, however, there are folks who work under them, right, who might, uh, might be at the two-star or three-star level, but junior to some of these folks. Um, and there are often various positions within the military that are kind of key positions for moving uh, on, right? If you're thinking about uh, developing your career, right, not every position is necessarily created equally. Uh, former commander of the 1st Infantry Division, John Kolosheki, went on to serve on the Joint Staff before he was later promoted to serve as commander of the 5th Corps. Um, while it's not a Joint Staff position, Joseph Martin, who is currently uh, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, was a couple of years ago, just, uh, just recently here, was the Commanding General of the 1st Infantry Division here at Fort Riley. So the 1st ID itself has been uh, a sort of stepping stone, if you will, to thinking about uh, you know, how people's careers progress to higher rank and more influence. Now, as I said, this was a little bit dated, uh, but there have been some big changes here uh, this, this past couple of years specifically with respect to the composition of the military. Now, I've mentioned this before, so it's, uh, you know, there have been a, a few spoilers right along the way, uh, but the creation of Space Force is a huge development in the, in the sort of overall structure and the look of the United States military, and it represents the first time a new service branch has been added to the U.S. military since the National Security Act of 1947 created the Air Force, right? It pulled the Army Air Corps and the Army apart and made them separate branches. Uh, the Space Force was established by the uh, 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, and notably, the act also establishes kind of the broader infrastructure, right? There are some other positions like the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy uh, that have been created uh, as a result of this legislation. Now, as I mentioned before, Space Force does not have a department of the Space Force, right? Like there's a department of the Army. Uh, Space Force exists within the Department of the Air Force alongside the Air Force, and so it answers to the civilian secretary uh, of the Air Force. Now, very quickly here, just to give you an overview of the, uh, the current uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff and the current composition here. Um, again, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. You can look over it yourself, but note down here at the, the lower right, we see John Raymond, General John Raymond, uh, who is the Chief of Space Operations, right? Uh, so note that a lot of these folks who are on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
they have different titles, right? Chief of Naval Operations, Chief, uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps. They are not all labeled as Chief of Staff, uh, but note that the, they are all of that equivalent position or status at the head of their service branches. Now, I want to give you a zoom out a little bit, right? We focused a lot on the military hierarchy, but the military is overwhelmingly made up of folks who don't look like the folks that we just talked about, right? Uh, by far, the enlisted ranks uh, constitute the bulk of the U.S. military. And so just uh, to give you a, a sense of, of, of how small the population of general officers, particularly four-star generals, are, uh, I put together these data here on the composition of the U.S. military as of uh, December of 2018 here. Uh, the color coding represents the different uh, branches of the U.S. military here. And then over on the left, you can see the various ranks, right? So uh, the E1, E2, E3, E4, right? These are, are the enlisted ranks. Uh, we're getting into, right, specialists, corporals, sergeants, staff sergeant, right, master sergeants, uh, folks like that. We have the warrant officer ranks in between. And then we have the commissioned officer ranks, starting with second lieutenant and ensign here over on the left, all the way up to general or admiral, right? When we talk about general or admiral, we're talking about somebody of the four-star rank, typically, right, in the, the formal sense. Um, although we may use general as a shorthand for somebody who holds a lower ranking general officer rank, uh, or similarly, we might use admiral to refer to somebody who's like a vice admiral or a, a rear admiral, for example. Um, but just know, again, that the general officer rank, right, this is very much kind of an artifact of, of how uh, Western European militaries have structured themselves over time. Uh, but notice that the, uh, uh, the commissioned officer rank is kind of like uh, a microcosm of the enlisted ranks, right? They both have this kind of bell curve shape. If you were to turn this on its side, there are a lot of captains, fewer majors and lieutenant commanders, even fewer uh, lieutenant colonels and commanders. Then you see a big big kind of drop here, uh, both between lieutenant colonel and colonel, but then also between colonel and the general officer ranks, right? There are very, very few people who make it to uh, that general officer or flag rank, right? That make it to rear admiral or brigadier general. So when we look at the enlisted ranks here, you can again see that there's a similar bell curve pattern, uh, but we have the bulk of the military personnel around the E4, uh, E5 rank here, and then there's a, a quite a drop between E5 and E6. Now E4, E5, E6, uh, at least in the, the context of the army, uh, is a corporal, sergeant, staff sergeant, right? That's um, those uh, uh, kind of early, mid, non-commissioned officer ranks here. Um, but again, overall, right, the, the vast majority of U.S. military personnel are enlisted. Um, this tapers off quite a bit here. The warrant officer kind of core is very small. Uh, and then we see growth again in the junior commissioned officer ranks. Uh, this, again, peaks with captain and then tapers off quite a bit. So, um, you know, there's an important point here to make, though, and that is that the folks who make uh, the military, their career, right, tend to be a really small group among both commissioned and non-commissioned officers, right? When you get up to that E7, E8, E9 uh, uh, range, and when you get up to um, senior majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels, uh, these are folks who have been in for quite a long time and have made a career out of the military, uh, e even uh, you know, more so when we think about general officer ranks or flag, uh, flag ranks. Um, and so there are very few people who make the military their career in this way, right? The bulk of the military um, is composed of people who are in for a relatively short period of time uh, and then leave after, after a few years of military service. Uh, now, what is important to take away from this, though, is this idea of what do we expect military service to uh, kind of imbue into people who have it, right? Um, here at Kansas State University, and in our department in particular, we work a lot with military officers, uh, senior captains, new majors, who are coming through the Command and General Staff College. Uh, other schools, like the Naval War College, right, or the Army War College, are military institutions dedicated to dealing with military personnel at the lieutenant colonel or colonel rank. These are folks who are uh, going on for continuing education within the context of the military. They are spending almost all of their time not just thinking about their functional duties as military officers, but also about broader kind of conceptual issues related to international security, related to management, related to financing and accounting. Right, these are people who have, uh, going back to the previous lecture on the bureaucracies, these are people who have very much a bureaucratic component to their job or people for whom thinking about theory and kind of evidence-based practice 
are really important for figuring out how to do their jobs better. So note that there's a big difference here, right, between, um, you know, people who are perhaps in the organization for a really long time and people who aren't, right, in terms of what we should expect them to have uh, taken away from that military experience, right? There are folks who dedicate a lot of time to continuing professional military education, and there are some folks who, you know, may serve in the military and never get that. Now, it doesn't mean that these folks don't know anything, right? They know a lot of stuff. There is often a disconnect between planning and kind of higher concept uh, aspects of military planning and how things actually play out in the field. And ultimately, you need some connection, right? You need communication and feedback uh, between the lower rank folks who are actually doing the work and can tell you uh, if there are problems in implementation. Uh, you need these folks to be able to provide input to people who are uh, maybe higher up in command and are doing more of the kind of uh, big picture conceptual kind of thinking, but are maybe divorced from the actual execution of these plans. Now, this is something we've run into quite a bit in our interviews, for example, even people who are career military officials, maybe at the commander, lieutenant colonel rank, uh, maybe colonel rank. These are folks who spend a lot of time thinking about how to do their jobs and thinking about abstract concepts and planning and implementation at a higher level, uh, but they're often very much removed from uh, the actual field experience or the ability to monitor what is going on in the field and whether or not these programs are um, effectual, right? So it's important that we have not just communication between lower and higher ranking uh, personnel, but also between military and non-military officials who might have the skill sets that can help military officials to better understand their own work and whether or not their work is, is proving to be effective. Now, I spent a lot of time on that because I think it's something that we don't often talk about in the context of, of classes like this, but I do think it's important. Uh, so we're going to go on again to just kind of briefly going through some of the key organizational structures here associated with the military. I've talked about a lot of this before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, here we're going to talk about the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Again, I've, I've hit on this before, but this is uh, a group made up of the people who are the top of each service branch, right? And the responsibilities are generally to those service branches and to civilian leaders in Congress and to the executive branch. Um, they serve as uniform military advisors to uh, the president and to Congress. Um, this can create some tensions as we will talk about later, uh, but they are also responsible for coming up with service doctrine, planning, equipment, uh, recruitment, right? All, all of these things, the basic functioning of each service branch. Uh, again, as I've talked about before, the combatant commanders are people who we don't necessarily see as much of in the media, especially when there is not as much focus on a large kind of active and ongoing war. Uh, but they're really, really important because they are the folks who actually uh, do the kind of commanding during wartime and guide military operations in the field. Uh, General David Petraeus here is probably the most famous recent combatant commander. Uh, he rose to prominence uh, for his work in Iraq uh, during the Iraq War, uh, was ultimately promoted to commander of Central Command to oversee the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and then kind of took a, a sort of demotion of sorts to guide um, the, uh, the attempt to replicate the Iraq surge in Afghanistan. He uh, uh, took a a sort of nominal demotion to oversee military operations in Afghanistan specifically. Uh, and so, you know, again, these folks are really important because they're the ones who are actually guiding the, the war efforts. Uh, again, quick map here, you can look at this on your own, but this just gives you a quick sense of the, the geographic areas of responsibility associated with each of the commands. Okay, now we're going to talk about the military in politics, right? The military can itself be a political actor. It can also be an actor that strives to remain apolitical, uh, but which is acted upon by other political actors in the civilian side. And the reality is there are a, a range of complex kind of relationships. Uh, there's a constant tug of war in the military among active duty personnel, uh, the leadership and civilian personnel and, and leaders. Um, and then there's also uh, retired military officers and, and how they relate to politics, right? These are, it's an incredibly complicated uh, kind of set of arrangements, but the, the central point that you should take away here is that the military is an intensely political 
actor, an intensely political entity, even when it is trying to be apolitical, because that itself is very much a political act or political state. So there's a long tradition in the United States of thinking about the military as apolitical, right? But what does that mean? Uh, again, civilian control, to put a finer point on it, civilian control of the military is a political arrangement. Um, you know, if we think about politics in the broadest sense of who gets what, where, why, and when, uh, and how, right, what are the, the rules governing these arrangements, um, saying that the military does not get to directly intervene in political processes, uh, to say that the civilian uh, side of government is supreme, right, to the military, this is a really important political arrangement, and it's one that uh, requires a lot of nurturing and a lot of care to sustain. Now, I think Peter Favor, a uh, political scientist at Duke, put this really clearly when he uh, presented this as a puzzle, right? He said, how do we, quote, reconcile a military strong enough to do anything that the civilians ask with a military subordinate enough to do only what civilians authorize? So again, you have this kind of strange relationship where you have a, an incredibly powerful military in the case of the United States and a civilian government that is kind of by definition, right, not armed, it is not a military entity, and yet it exerts uh, authority and power over the military, right? So this is central to the American political system and it's something that is quite frequently tried. It's a, a relationship that is quite frequently strained, particularly in the last couple of years. Now, there are a couple of key components of civil military relations that I want to talk about for the purposes of this class. We're not going to get to everything here. We could easily have an entire class on uh, civil military relations, but I want you to think about three kinds of dimensions to this question, right? There's one, how is the civilian population, uh, or how do the civilian population and the military, how do they relate to one another, right? What is the general uh, kind of big picture, broad strokes relationship between civilians and military? Now in the United States, for example, um, you know, we have a fairly large number of people who have served in the military. Again, it's popular to look at active duty uh, military personnel relative to the uh, you know, proportion of the population that were active duty back in 1950, but this isn't necessarily a great metric, right? There are about you know, 20, 24, maybe a little bit more, a million people who have served in the military. Uh, the, you know, veteran population. So there, there's quite a large population of Americans that have military experience. Um, and there is this question of how does the broader society relate to those who have military experience? Um, and this has been a really important issue over the last 20 years as the U.S. has engaged in two of the longest wars in its history. Uh, but civilian oversight and civilian uh, governance and uh, really just civilian attention more broadly, not just in government, but uh, more broadly, has been really lacking in a lot of respects. And so this uh, really risks you know, straining some of these broader norms of civil military relations when you have uh, a fairly large population of people who have served in the military that feel like they are putting themselves on the line and the civilian population doesn't really know or care. Right? So in, in broad terms, uh, we risk building resentment right, among uh, or between military and non-military -mil elements of the population. The second point here, military actors intervening in civilian political processes is another key point, right? This would be, uh, at, at the worst, right, worst form, it would be a coup. Um, in uh, less uh, kind of dire circumstances, right, it could be military, active duty military officials endorsing political, uh, political candidates. Now, we've seen variants of this, you know, over the last few years. This year, for example, the Democratic National Convention, there was footage of two soldiers, I believe they were both specialists in uniform, um, with uh, Democratic delegates, right, appearing in, in filmed or televised footage that aired during the Democratic National Convention. Um, and this, this was, you know, problematic from the perspective of the appearance that military personnel are endorsing one political candidate or the other, right? Military uh, personnel take an oath to the Constitution, not to particular leaders or to particular parties. And so this is a norm that's really important to enforce uh, and, and police where we see violations. Now, last, there's this issue of civilians politicizing the military. And this can happen uh, for more or less nefarious sort of reasons, right, or it can happen because sometimes the oversight role of Congress uh, can bring military leaders into conflict with officials uh, in the military departments. One way that the military can be uh, the subject of political wrangling is the result of the fact that 
Republican and Democratic parties, uh, particularly in the post-war period, they've had very different preferences uh, with respect to the types of policies that they can enact. And this is, is really rooted in the fact that they serve fundamentally different constituencies. Um, there's research that shows that uh, right parties, not just in the United States, but throughout Western Europe and the United States, uh, right parties tend to represent the interests of, of capital intensive constituencies. Uh, they tend to like to do things like keep um, inflation in check. Uh, alternatively, uh, Democrats and left-leaning parties more broadly tend to serve the interests of labor. And so this, these preferences, very briefly, a uh, fuller discussion here is kind of outside the, the scope of what we have time for here, but these preferences basically affect uh, what the military looks like, what kind of force structure um, civilian leaders, Republicans and Democrats prefer. Very briefly, one way to think about it is that this means that Democrats preferring more uh, kind of a labor focus, right, are more inclined to favor more labor intensive militaries with a lot of personnel. Alternatively, Republicans, with their focus on the interests of capital, are more likely to favor more capital-intensive military structures uh, that are less reliant on, on uh, labor-heavy um, uh, sort of service populations and more on uh, high-technology uh, kind of products and weapon systems. Right? We see this a lot during the Reagan administration, for example, uh, where inflation-adjusted military expenditures exceed what we've seen in either Korea or Vietnam, and yet military personnel uh, do not increase. Right? There's no active war going on, uh, and this was, was really the result of just a massive increase in expenditures on more capital-intensive projects. Uh, but Ben Fordham, a political scientist at Binghamton University, has done some work on this. And what I'm showing you here on this slide just kind of tries to follow up with what he's done. Uh, but he has a, a paper that shows that these preferences over policy affect the civilian selection of military leaders. Right? Remember that, uh, for example, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is somebody that is selected by uh, presidents, right? They're selected by presidents, and these selections may reflect these underlying economic interests. And so what this table shows you here is the party of the president over on the left column, and then the number of uh, chairs of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that presidents from these two parties have picked. So for example, Democrats have picked one um, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from the Air Force, they've picked six from the Army. Uh, alternatively, Republicans have picked three Air Force generals to be chair uh, and four Army. And basically what Fordham finds is that there is a statistically significant difference uh, between these groups. Now, his paper ends in, I believe, 1997. The data for his paper ends in 1997. And so I've updated it a little bit here, and you can see the, the chi-squared statistic that it kicks back is uh, 0.18. Uh, and so the relationship has weakened a little bit since that time, right? We've had about 20 years, 23 years. Uh, in that time period. And so the, the relationship between partisanship and which service branch uh, they're going to, uh, to draw from when they select chairs of the Joint Chiefs, it's weakened a little bit, but this may reflect evolving macroeconomic policy preferences or interests of constituents uh, in the intervening time period. There may be other factors at work that, that are kind of altering this. Uh, but during the Cold War time period, there's much stronger evidence uh, that the party of the president and the underlying uh, macroeconomic interests are influencing who they pick for the overall structure of, of the military. Another thing that we can think about here is the military itself as being political. Um, we don't have a lot of great public opinion data specifically on the attitudes and preferences of military personnel, but here the Foreign Policy Leadership Project, which uh, surveyed uh, different groups of people over multiple waves across a couple of decades, um, this is probably the best data that I'm aware of that show us you know, things like party ID, right, of, of military officials. And if we're thinking about military officials as being partisan actors, right, if there's a norm of not engaging in partisan politics, um, this is one way to get at whether or not anything has, has changed over time, whether or not there is a crisis in civil military relations, and whether or not military officials uh, are actually behaving in more partisan ways uh, across time. Um, and this, you know, in, in turn, right, if there is evidence of such a phenomenon unfolding, uh, then we have to think about, well, what do we do about it and what does this mean? Uh, the left panel here shows public opinion data, specifically uh, party self-identification, 
uh, for civilian uh, policymakers. The middle here are military officers, and on the right here we have the general public. Um, so notably, each, each line represents the percent of respondents in each group that self-identify uh, as a Democrat, Independent, or, or Republican here. Uh, the blue and red are Democrat and Republican respectively, and what is showing up as black on your screen represents uh, independence. Uh, now, notably in the civilian and the public uh, uh, panels, you can see relatively similar patterns, uh, although there is a higher propensity for people to self-identify as independents uh, in this uh, general uh, public panel. Uh, but in the military panel here, we see a, a big increase in Republican self-identification between the 1970s and 2000, uh, we also see a sharp decline in self-identified independents. Uh, we see Democrats uh, a slight decline here, but more or less remaining stable. Uh, so there is some evidence here, one, that military personnel are increasingly likely to self-identify as Republicans. Uh, but we have to think about what this means, right? And there are a couple of important points that I, I want to draw out here. The first is that self-identifying in the context of a survey does not necessarily mean that they are behaving uh, in a way that is inherently more partisan. Uh, the second issue here to think about is that there is a trade-off between independents and Republicans, and Democrats are remaining relatively stable. Uh, about 12-15% um, here of, of uh, pool are self-identifying as, uh, as Democrats. Um, and what this indicates here is that there is a trade-off, right? People who formerly would identify as independent are increasingly identifying as uh, Republicans. So the key question here becomes, well, are people actually becoming more Republican? Are there more self-identified Republicans? Or are they just identifying more closely with the Republican Party when their underlying ideology has always been to the right uh, over time? And so it's not necessarily clear from these survey results that um, there is an increase in, for example, the uh, proportion of or the percent of military personnel who are actually conservative. Right? It's likely, given the uh, flat line here for the Democrats, that military personnel have always been more to the right of other segments of American society. Uh, but what we're seeing here is a change in party self-identification, which is not the same thing as underlying ideology or policy preferences. Um, so again, this is something that we could have a fuller discussion of, um, but this is, is certainly something that um, you know, many folks look at and and express some concern about, right? If people are increasingly in these sorts of roles uh, that are supposed to be nonpartisan, if they are increasingly identifying with one party over the other, does this affect behavior, right? And that is kind of the key question that we have to think about. Now, there have been other examples of military officers behaving in more overtly political ways, but ways that don't neatly map onto the left-right spectrum that we're typically thinking about. Uh, ways that um, are more akin to uh, stepping out of line with respect to the chain of command and trying to buck civilian uh, authority, right, rather than necessarily siding with one party uh, over the other. Um, so again, there are uh, ways that the military officials can behave that are political with respect to partisan politics, uh, siding with one party over the other, or they can behave in a political way by attempting to countermand or overrule civilian officials. And we see this in the late 1940s during this period of reorganization in an event uh, known as the Revolt of the Admirals. Um, Again, as I mentioned before, this was a time of, of intense uncertainty for the service branches. The Navy and Marine Corps were afraid that they were going to be relocated to kind of transport uh, functions and that the Marine Corps might be abolished altogether. Uh, and with the rise of the atomic bomb and the Air Force's strategic bombing capabilities, um, they were worried that they would be left out of some of the core uh, combat and war fighting functions uh, for, for the next generation of, of American defense. Um, now, again, the Navy was really concerned here that the Air Force had this emphasis on strategic bombing, and so they were making efforts to develop a supercarrier that would enable them to participate in strategic bombing by launching heavier bombers off of larger carriers at sea. Now, the problem was at this time that the supercarriers were approved and initially being planned, the uh, capabilities, the technology for these bombers didn't actually exist. So a lot of this was kind of hypothetical or prospective uh, with respect to building the Navy's uh, capacity. 
Uh, now, President Truman was um, a big kind of budget hawk. He was really scared of, uh, of inflation and wanted to keep the defense budget reined in. And the problem was that these supercarriers were enormously expensive. And so Truman and Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson made the decision to cease production of these supercarriers. And this really rankled Navy leadership and allies of the Navy at the time. Now, supercarrier production was halted in April 23rd of 1949, but the Secretary of the Navy, John Sullivan, wasn't consulted. So he actually ended up resigning in protest over this decision uh, because he felt that the Navy's interests weren't being represented, they weren't really being heard by the Truman administration by Secretary of Defense Johnson. Um, the House Armed Services Committees and Allies of the Navy ultimately began hearings in the summer of 1949 with some really flimsy evidence of corruption on the part of Johnson and the senior Defense Department civilian officials. Um, Navy leadership and uh, both active duty and retired personnel began publicly attacking civilian leadership of the Department of Defense, uh, also attacking the Army and the Air Force, uh, and basically accusing everybody of being out to get the Navy and being out to uh, eliminate the Navy's role in, in national defense. So again, the key here is that you have Navy officials taking very public stances uh, in opposition to, right, uh, purposely antagonizing and going after civilian leadership, uh, which is very much the, the opposite of civilian supremacy over the military, right? Um, but this speaks to kind of a, a key issue here, which is uh, that, you know, military officials, right, even though they have the expertise and the knowledge and know-how when it comes to uh, national security affairs are still beholden to the decisions made by civilian authority. Ultimately, it took the intervention of people like General Omar Bradley here, who uh, was known from his time in World War II, to kind of quash this, this rebellion, right, this revolt of the admirals. Uh, Bradley weighed in saying, quote, uh, referring to naval leadership, he said, quote, they're fancy dans who won't hit the line. Um, unless they could call out the signals. He said, I believe uh, the public hearings of grievances of a few officers who will not accept the decisions of the authorities established by law have done infinite harm to our national defense, our position of leadership in world affairs, uh, the position of our national policy, and the confidence of the people in their government. End quote. So again, Bradley's testimony was really instrumental here in bringing this chapter to a close. Uh, but uh, again, this was something where you had a lot of high-ranking military officials uh, who were actively speaking out to members of Congress. And to be clear, some members of Congress were soliciting uh, these kinds of attacks, right? They were providing a platform for and were allied with uh, military officials who were expressing these grievances. Uh, Marine Commandant Clifton Cates here uh, was not invited to a conference in Key West in 1948 that dealt with some of these restructuring issues. And as a result, during these House Armed Services Committee hearings, uh, Cates spoke up and backed the Navy and uh, basically accused the other branches of attempting to uh, strip the Marine Corps and the Navy of their rightful place uh, in the defense community. Now, this is something that the Marine Corps in particular struggles with for quite a while. Uh, the Marine Corps, because they fall within the Department of the Navy, uh, are represented at various times by the Chief of Naval Operations. This changes in the 1970s when the Marines are finally uh, invited to uh, have permanent representation on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which was not always the case before the 1970s. Now, it's also possible, as I mentioned before, that military leaders can kind of get sucked into politics uh, just by performing their basic functions in an honest kind of fashion. Now, this was the case in the buildup to the Iraq uh, War in 2003. Now, there were hearings held in the U.S. Senate uh, prior to the actual invasion, and there had been a lot of concern in the lead up to the war and the push to the war over whether or not the U.S. was adequately prepared to undertake another war, given that we were already involved in a war in Afghanistan. Now, Army Chief of Staff Eric Shinseki testified before uh, the Senate during one of these uh, committee hearings and was being grilled by Senator Carl Levin, a Democrat, on what the actual force requirements looked like. Um, what did the United States uh, you know, actually need to, to successfully prosecute this war, to successfully wage war in Iraq? And ultimately, uh, Shinseki broke down and said, uh, you know, we need several hundreds of thousands of military personnel. Now, the reason that this is important, uh, it may seem kind of glaringly obvious that you need a lot of personnel to invade another country. But the reason that this is really important is because if you go back to previous lectures, you know, we've talked a little bit about how Donald Rumsfeld and other officials in the Bush administration came into office with this goal of shrinking the U.S. military. 
they also made a, a long uh, public affairs kind of effort to assure Americans and assure allies that uh, the invasion of Iraq would go swiftly and that it would not require a lot of manpower because U.S. forces would be greeted as liberators. This turned out to obviously not be true, right? The military, once it invades and, and defeats a foreign military, right, once it defeat, uh, defeated the Iraqi military, for example, it becomes responsible for post-war, post-conflict stabilization operations, and in many cases, even basic functions like trash and sanitation, the provision of electricity, running water, right, public utilities, uh, they become responsible for all of these things. And so military personnel can very quickly become stretched uh, even if you have a force that was sufficient to defeat an enemy military, the post-war stabilization component is very different and may require very different types of expertise, may require uh, many, many more people uh, to, to complete that component successfully. Now, last year, we're going to talk about the politicization of military leaders. Uh, now, this is something that has increasingly become a problem. We've seen this in the 2016 campaigns. Uh, both the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Donald Trump campaign uh, relied on high-ranking retired military leaders to kind of bolster their legitimacy, to bolster their claims to office. Um, on the left here, we see uh, General Michael Flynn, no relation. Uh, and on the right here, we see um, retired General John Allen, four-star general in the Marine Corps. But the point here is that it has increasingly become common for civilian political leaders uh, to use military officials, retired military officials, as kind of a backstop, uh, again, to bolster their legitimacy. Um, this is something that has become especially problematic over the past 20 years in particular, um, and again speaks to the appropriate role of the military in U.S. politics and U.S. society. You know, it is problematic for su civilian supremacy over the military if civilians first need to get the approval or the nod from retired military officials before the public thinks that they are capable of serving in office. It also speaks to the very kind of narrow and myopic view that a lot of people have with respect to national security affairs. And that is that national security affairs and the military are synonymous. This is really not true. There are a lot of civilians who dedicate their lives and their entire careers to national security issues. There are a lot of civilians, for example, who uh, dedicate their lives to nuclear nonproliferation. This is something that requires an incredible amount of technical expertise. And, you know, there are uh, more broadly a ton of diplomats, right? The State Department, Treasury Department, people who work on trade negotiations, who work on diplomatic uh, negotiations more broadly. Um, and so this, this emphasis, right, this elevation of military officials, even if they are retired, poses a problem because it seems to say something about how American society and the American people think about foreign policy and think about national security affairs. And again, that is that they are synonymous with the military and that the military uh, somehow has all of the knowledge and expertise necessary to successfully address these issues, uh, which is just, again, not true. And we'll talk about this more in subsequent lectures. Now, more recently here, um, this past summer has seen a real elevation of this uh, this conflict, right? This crisis in civil military relations and the politicization of military officers. Now, politicians often want to be seen with military officials as a way of being seen to be tough, to be serious, and, you know, to, again, um, suggest that they have the backing or endorsement of the military, even where such explicit backing or endorsements are uh, prohibited or are not possible. Um, now, we saw this over the summer when President Trump and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley, along with Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Attorney General uh, Bob Barr, um, walked from the White House to St. John's Episcopal Church. On its own, this is unremarkable, except for the fact that Attorney General Barr had ordered force to be used to disperse peaceful protesters uh, to allow the president to, to walk. Um, also, what's key about this is that General Milley and uh, Secretary Esper had later said that they were unaware that this entire exercise was essentially for a photo op for the president to be seen walking to the church um, to, to be seen kind of dispersing protesters, and ultimately he held up a Bible, I think, at the church, and that was pretty much it. He didn't pray, he didn't really do anything else. Um, but this ultimately put Milley in particular in the uh, kind of precarious position of having to distance himself from this later on. Um, and so we, again, see military personnel being used to convey seriousness for politicians, right? 
This is a way in which politicians try to exploit their proximity to the military. Um, elected officials in particular who have access to the military can use that access in, in literal physical proximity uh, to, to uh, help voters to identify them with the military if they have, say, a positive view of the military as an institution. Um, the idea is that some of that positive view will rub off on politicians who are seen to be pro-military or, or serious uh, like the military. Now, further problem is that this event prompted uh, unprecedented backlash. Admiral Mike Mullen, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, and uh, uh, Trump's own first Secretary of Defense, uh, General James Mattis, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, uh, former general in the Marine Corps, former commander of Central Command, uh, both publicly spoke out to rebuke the president for this behavior and for pitting the military against uh, peaceful civilian protesters. Now, again, this is, uh, is relatively unprecedented, but it also creates uh, problems, not just that the, these officials had to do this, but also that military officials like this, retired military officials like this, are viewed as somehow superior authorities, uh, moral authorities, right, professional authorities, to speak out against this kind of behavior. Um, so even by opponents of President Trump leaning on figures like this and statements like this, it is further pushing military officials into a kind of primacy of place when it comes to when it comes to how we should view the military in the context of American society and who has legitimacy and who has authority. Now, notably for Madison in particular, this was the first time he had publicly spoken out against President Trump, and he used incredibly strong language describing him as a threat to the Constitution. Um, and so this is, is an incredibly remarkable public rebuke uh, by former military officials. And while many people cheer it, it is itself, again, not without cost. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, next time we will be talking about the policymaking process and thinking about, uh, again, more abstractly, how do, how do all of these agencies and kind of components relate to one another uh, for the sake of, of actually making Okay, take care. Have a good week. Bye-bye.